Now, the Three Martini Lunch with Greg Columbus and Jim Garrity. And welcome, everyone, to the Tuesday edition of the Three Martini Lunch, along with Jim Garrity of National Review. I'm Greg Columbus of Radio America. Good, bad, and crazy martinis for conservatives today. But, Jim, here in the Washington, D.C. area, before we get to the martinis, it's Tuesday. Friday, we're going to get some weather. It could be a lot of snow. It could be a little snow. It could be a mix. It could be nothing at all. And already the region is practically paralyzed. So uh, I hope you're going to enjoy your milk and bread now. <laughs> Stockpile your supplies. They're calling for wintry mix. <laughs> Greg, we need to form a band called Wintry Mix. <laughs> oh, man. It's always fun. All right. On to the good martini now. This is courtesy of Hot Air, which got the story courtesy of the Daily Beast. It turns out uh, the Pentagon is going to consider retroactively demoting retired General David Petraeus after he admitted to giving classified information to his biographer slash mistress while he was still in uniform, three people with knowledge of the matter told the Daily Beast. The decision now rests with Secretary of Defense Ash Carter, who is said to be willing to consider overruling an earlier recommendation by the Army that Petraeus not have his rank reduced. Such a demotion could cost the storied general hundreds of thousands of dollars and deal an additional blow to his once pristine reputation. In addition to the fact that Petraeus committed a potentially very serious crime here by sharing classified information with his biographer slash mistress, Paula Broadwell, it's interesting that it's essentially the same crime the FBI is investigating Hillary Clinton for with not securing classified information that came through that private server. And Ed Morrissey, who wrote the piece for Hot Air, concludes the piece by saying... Are people of Hillary Clinton's fame and esteemed reputation immune to punishment? Perhaps <laughs> Ash Carter might want to provide Loretta Lynch with a lesson on ethics and accountability before taking a second bite out of David Petraeus. Or maybe, just maybe, that's Carter's point. So, Jim, interesting to see what will happen to Petraeus, but uh, even more interesting what sort of precedent it could set for this long investigation into Hillary. Most people look at David Petraeus and feel mixed feelings. Inexcusable what he did. Separate from the affair, giving her access to classified information is just remarkably boneheaded. Plea bargain down to a misdemeanor, you know, pays a $100,000 fine, which is a, you know, significant chunk of change. Two years of probation. And the real challenge was, you know, losing access to classified material, which means he's going to lose some of his appeal on the, uh, as a consultant. Although keeping in mind, he's got, he has at least one teaching gig. He'll have any university would be thrilled to have him on. Uh, on staff. He's going to get a book deal. He's got the speaking gigs. David Petraeus is going to be fine. In fact, I would say it's not unthinkable he could end up returning to government service someday at the request of a president who could say, look, you know, he's paid his price and all that stuff. The message from Ash Carter, though, is that if Petraeus is going to get hit twice for this, you can't decide, oh, Hillary didn't do anything wrong. This is nothing. This is not important. It's and everything's, you know, uh, fine. In fact, I kind of have this feeling that this seems like a signal from Ash Carter or maybe other people in uniform to say, look, you know, if we take it seriously over here, you can't not take that seriously over there. And we will see how it shakes out. Uh, but one of the easy contrasts in this argument is the more that Hillary insists she did nothing wrong, um, it seems like her wrongdoings in terms of handling mis- uh, mishandling classified information are on a much larger scale than Petraeus's. And the consequences for her so far have been none. Now, we'll see if there are any. Um, but it's very hard to argue that David Petraeus committed a crime and Hillary Clinton did not. Uh, now, Jim, David Petraeus obviously could have been hit with a truckload of felonies here. Ultimately, it got pled down to misdemeanors. If it's misdemeanors that uh, end up on the plate for Hillary Clinton, is the political damage effectively the same? That's a really good question. I, I, I'd actually been arguing that in a way, like the, the worst case scenario for Hillary is she's indicted on, you know, significant charges. If she's not indicted, it's almost as damaging because I think you can you and I can imagine what what Donald Trump or Ted Cruz or just about any Republican candidate would say, because one way or another, that FBI report is going to come back. Uh, If the FBI report recommends prosecution and Obama's Justice Department decides no, (laughs) that's, you know, the argument will be, look, she should have been indicted, but only a corrupt Department of Justice spared her. In a way, actually, what you're describing there, Greg, I think being indicted on misdemeanors and and paying a fine and things like that might be the best case scenario for her. 
and that it gets dealt with, but not in a way, probably not severely enough to derail her presidential hopes. Hmm. Well, let's hope I'm wrong about that then. Okay, on to, on to the bad martini now. And uh, as we mentioned on Friday, one of the big dust-ups from the most recent presidential debate uh, was towards the very end uh, between Marco Rubio and Ted Cruz as they talked about who stood where on the immigration fight and who's the bigger flip-flopper and so forth. Marco Rubio was on Meet the Press with Chuck Todd over the weekend, and it seems like this came up towards the very end of the interview, uh, where Chuck Todd asked Rubio where he still stands on what to do about the millions of people illegally in the country. Let me ask you, by the way, quickly on the uh, 11 million. Are you still for finding a way for them to legally stay in the United States? Yeah, look, if you're a criminal alien, no, you can't stay. Uh, if you're someone that hasn't been here for a very long time, you can't stay. Wait a minute. I define criminal alien. have a reasonable De- solution. Define criminal alien. Isn't a anybody felon? who's here illegal? Okay, so not because well, some people argue immigration law. Yeah, right? I mean, just, obviously, okay. but, right. No, but I've said that before, Todd. That's been convinced. I mean, the, the, a felon, someone who's committed okay. a, a crime, a non-immigration related, obviously, the, and that's what I've talked about in the past. Mm-hmm. So I do believe. I don't think you're going to round up and deport 12 million people. Here's what I've said, though. It is very clear now more than ever that we are not going to be able to do anything on people that are here illegally <laughs> until we first... Prove to people that illegal immigration is under control and America is safe. Jim, it's hard to convince a lot of people not to come illegally if unless you're a felon, you get to stay. So that's a a pretty low bar he's asking to clear here. Marco, Marco, Marco. (laughs) The notion of whether illegal immigrants have broken the law would seem pretty clear in the title, (laughs) illegal immigrants. You know, like, and so, yeah, you're you're right. I, I could understand the argument Let's start with those who've committed violent crimes. Let's start with those who we know are indisputably threats. But this is just, you know, I I suppose we could salute Rubio for for sticking by a position that he's got to know is unpopular with Republican primary voters. But at the very least, like, what do we get from letting these people stay into the country? And I feel like, oh, they're, they're, you know, good-hearted Americans or they want to be Americans and they're, 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 you know— Bus boys and, and they've got the American dream and, and all that kind of stuff. But their first act in this country was to break the law. <laughs> I have a very hard time believing, oh, you really want to be a good American if you don't respect the law there. And so I, it's just it's frustrating to see this from Rubio. Um, he's got to know that this is, you know, uh, probably the weakest point of his argument. And just the, the Republican base does not understand why we have to bend over backwards who have broken the law and who continue to demonstrate disregard for the law. Uh, every day that they're here. And and this idea that, oh, if we just bring them out of the shadows, everything will be fine. I'm just not buying it. If you want to argue, prioritize the violent ones first, fine. But uh, if Rubio does not win the, the, the nomination, is it, I don't think there's any way to argue. This is this is what cost him the nomination. And he obviously, you know, he, he moved his position from when he was with the Gang of Eight to now. Why he couldn't go that extra mile, um, either he's very principled or he's just politically very foolish. It's, it's fascinating because obviously you have the uh, polar opposites here. You have Trump who wants to deport everybody illegally and a lot of folks who don't want to do that saying it's it's not possible logistically. You're kicking down doors and it looks like a police state on one hand. And then they say, well, you can't even afford all this. It would cost hundreds of billions of dollars. The question never seems to pop up. Well, how many can we deport? Uh, yeah, we, uh, we did 400,000 in one year uh, a couple of years ago. So So conceivably... You know, we could do at least that every year for a, for a sustained period of time. And who knows? If you commit more resource, you might get to, to it. Even more, Greg, by the way, you know, it's the, the always the lament kicking down doors. Greg, don't police kick down doors. <laughs> like, it's kind of part of the job, whether it's a, you know, drug raid, SWAT team, hostages, you know, like, police kick down doors. That's going to happen. It's part, you know, knocking gently. <laughs> doesn't always work for for the police. So they're going to have to do it. I, I don't understand this argument is sponsored by the dorm frame makers of America or something <laughs> like that. But there's just you know, like, oh, it's such an ugly image. Well, don't these folks watch cop shows? Right? They're kicking in doors all the time. <laughs> yes, and usually, so they do make mistakes sometimes, but usually they're kicking down the doors of people who have, you know, committed a crime. Maybe you know, it's like, you know, you, we kick down the wrong door, you get a free door, right? I think that, <laughs> let's, let's make that. There's one Trumpian executive order I'll be fine with, and then we can start doing all the deportions we want to do. Well, from one crime to another crime, and that is the lack of diversity in Oscar nominations. The Oscars, I believe, are towards the end of next month, but the nominations came out recently, and there is a whole hullabaloo about the lack of diversity among the nominees, particularly in the acting categories. As a result, we have now boycotts from at least Spike Lee and Jada Pinkett Smith. 
Jim, obviously, it's a um, liberal atmosphere. People want to see diversity, I guess, in the nominees. It seems, though, that when there's a, a prominent actor or a prominent movie uh, involving black characters, I'm thinking of 12 Years a Slave or Django Unchained. We've obviously seen black Oscar winners over the last decade. What's really going on here? I see this headline and I'm just like, meh. <laughs> you know, of, of all the problems in the world, this doesn't strike me as a really huge deal. Now, if I were Samuel L. Jackson, I'd be very offended by this. If I were any, if I were an African American actor who thought I had turned in a really good performance and I had gotten snubbed, I'd be really upset. And probably the, the you know, one of the examples, um, Michael B. Jordan was the was the uh, one who was in Creed. Uh, and people said he gave a really good performance. People said Will Smith was really good in Concussion. Didn't see either one of those. Couldn't you know tell you whether that's a fair gripe. But in the end, how many people have been really terribly unfairly snubbed by this, Greg? Like a half dozen? There aren't that many people who said, oh, I gave a spectacular performance and I didn't get nominated. No, you only get five nominations. So um, I, I was kind of struck by this. The, 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 you know, Jada Pinkett Smith is going to boycott it. Uh, she's the wife of Will Smith, who felt like he had, you know, deserved a nomination for for his performance this year. But he's been nominated twice before, and both times he lost. He lost to another African American actor. So the idea that the Academy Awards have some sort of systemic or consistent uh, bias against African American actors and actresses doesn't seem to hold up here. Now, as I mentioned in the jolt, you could make an argument that a lot more people went to see Creed than they went to see any one of the uh, best actor movies uh, other than um, The Martian. Uh, Matt Damon was nominated for that one. Like, it, like almost nobody went to see Steve Jobs that had, um, technically the actor's name is Michael Fassbender, Greg. Yes. Uh, but to me, he's always Magneto. <laughs> so because of that, it was this stunning realization that Steve Jobs, in fact, was Magneto. Um, <laughs> But the point being that th- this strikes me as the most insidery, inside baseball uh, example of, of you know, a, an injustice in the entire world. Yet this is giving an enormous amount of attention, and people are you know really upset about this. And there's pressure on Chris Rock to not host the actors anymore. And you know, I'm content to let Hollywood argue about that. And if they, you know, let them sort it out, I don't understand why I'm just expected to rush to the aid of the Academy Awards. They. Uh, have been cultivating this this culture of grievance for so long. Let the Academy deal with it. I will say, uh, uh, Greg, when it comes to the true injustices in our society, shouldn't we really be focusing on what matters most? And to me, Greg, it's that didn't Harrison Ford deserve a Best Supporting Actor nomination for, <laughs> for coming back as Han Solo? You got to think Star so. Didn't Star Wars deserve a Best Picture nomination? That's injustice right there. Let the pro- I, I'm sure like right now like people are like, you know, furiously writing letters to me. It's like, Dear Mr. Garrity, you know, <laughs> what about the third act? <laughs> Well, you know, it, like you mentioned, it's almost kind of fun to watch a liberal institution uh, kind of get skewered over it, its its own politics uh, on this sort of thing like the Academy is. At the same time, I don't know if you saw this today, Jim, but Jada Pinkett Smith now has been called out by uh, the, the aunt from Fresh Prince uh, for thinking that she ought to be entitled to Oscar nominations, but the, the, that the fact that she even has a prominent job in Hollywood ought to be gratitude enough. So a little bit of hostility in the Banks house going on there. <laughs> well, again, like... How many? You know, they're only five. This is this is you know. Ironically, this is kind of like the Pro Bowl arguments, right? And whoever you want to put on, you should be taking off. I also went back and checked through all the best actor nominations. The only one who won is Redmayne for was the Danish girl, the girl who ate the Danish something. I don't know. <laughs> some art house flick that I'm never going to see, and most of the listeners probably are never going to see either. If you happen to go see it, enjoy it. Good for you. Uh, Leonardo DiCaprio is the one who's expected to win it this year for the um, the one where he's intimate with the, with a bear, and uh, that he's you know, but he's been nominated five times and never won. And so everybody's thinking, okay, this year is the makeup year, right? So <laughs> Stallone got the okay. He just you know he deserves one by now. Like all of these award nominations usually end up being some sort of who's mad at who or something like that. So. You know, if you're if you're a successful African American actor or actress, and you think you gave a great performance, and you feel snubbed, I'm sorry, I know how that feels. It it stinks, but you can't. If if your whole career is based upon getting one of these five nominations, you know, just enjoy the work that you do. I, I can't understand why you turn into this, you know, this this now national scandal here. That uh, I mean, or, or alternately, pick which one of the five you think shouldn't have gotten it. And I'm sure everyone's looking at Michael Fassbender. <laughs> That's fair to say he doesn't deserve it because, look, he may have done a great job. Nobody saw the movie. 
Well, that seems to be pretty common among Best Picture nominees. The Danish Girl just reminds me of a movie the folks on Seinfeld would end up seeing because something went horribly wrong with their plans to see prognosis negative or death blow. To Danish the movie. Girl sounds like the cliched historical drama uh, <laughs> movie that, that, that when they need a fictional title for an Oscar winner <laughs> in some other in the TV show or movie, that's the one that they use. <laughs> Uh, I would also point out, while we're on the topic of the Oscars, because that's exactly why everyone tunes into the three martini lunch. <laughs> right. Who's the one who was in Titanic? Kate Winslet. Kate Winslet. So Kate Winslet won her Oscar uh, it was a year, last year, a year before that, uh, for The Book Thief, in which she played someone who never learned to read. Greg, do you remember Wayne's World? <laughs> yes. In which his cliched Oscar bait scene and showed him for absolutely no reason whatsoever breaking down, crying, <laughs> screaming he never learned how to read. <laughs> and, they, and on the bottom of the screen, it's flashing Oscar clip, Oscar <laughs> clip. Yeah. So she actually did that and she actually won. So there you go. Oh, people will be studying Wayne's World for generations to see how to win an I mean, Oscar. It's not Die Hard, but. No, no of course not. No. Never. That should have won an Oscar, but that's a whole other story. Uh, Jim, on, on that note, talk to you tomorrow. See you tomorrow, Greg. Jim Garrity of National Review. I'm Greg Columbus of Radio America. Thanks for being with us today, and be sure to tune in again on Wednesday for the next Three Martini Lunch.